Today, I'll be speaking about the fourth sorrowful mystery, the carrying of the cross, continuing our series on the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. After our Lord was condemned to death, this was, of course, after his scourging, crowned with thorns, he was condemned to be, to be crucified, and those condemned to this form of punishment were forced to carry their cross to the place of execution to increase their pain and their disgrace. Our Lord was condemned as a common criminal and so had to accept the same penalty as a robber, as a murderer. The cross was looked upon as the worst sign of shame, of disgrace. There was no worse form of execution, no worse worse punishment that could be passed or executed upon someone. So the cross is not, as we see it today, a sign of hope, a sign of redemption, of grace, of the love of God. It was a sign of the worst form of execution, of shame. But Jesus accepted his cross willingly, embracing it, accepting it. We can picture him going to the place where the cross was prepared for him, covered in blood, the crown of thorns still on his head, his body torn from head to foot from the scourges, his face covered with spit and sweat and blood. His nose was broken at the very beginning of the passion when the servant of the high priest struck him. He had spent a night tied up in prison, had been brought to and fro, from Pilate to Herod, back to Pilate. If it were not for some exemption, some supernatural strength, no doubt he would have died from his tortures. But coming to the place where the cross was prepared for him, he did not shirk the cross, but embraced it. Though it was the embodiment of suffering, of shame, he looked beyond the external, the visible, the temporal, and saw beyond it the will of God, the will of his Father. This cross was to be the instrument of salvation for mankind, a future badge of honor, the symbol of all who would follow him. And so he embraced it. St. Andrew, the apostle, following the example of Christ, when the cross was prepared for him, for he suffered crucifixion as well. St. Andrew exclaimed when seeing it, O holy cross, O blessed cross, that will take me to my master. He knew, as did all of the saints, that our Lord had said, I have given you an example, that as I have done, so do you also. Christ accepted the cross as it came to him in the time, the place, the manner, the shape and size of the cross as it was given to him. He doesn't consider the cruelty of those who are forcing it upon him, the disgrace. He doesn't consider the injustice of those who force this upon him. He looks beyond to the love of his father. From his hands, he accepts the cross. This is a good thing for us to remember, to look for the hand that is behind our crosses. The same hand that clothes the lilies of the field, provides for the birds of the air. It is a hand of our loving Father who knows us, loves us, desires only our well-being. He permits nothing which will not be of some good to us. We have to look beyond what is visible to our eyes, what we can see, what we can feel. We have to look beyond the visible, the temporal, and see the invisible hand and purpose that is behind our crosses. But thus Christ begins the way of the cross, willingly accepting it. On the way of the cross, of course, he suffers from that shame and disgrace that is attached to 
crucifixion. The physical pains, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, worn out, suffering from the beatings and mistreatment of the entire night and day, the scourging and crowning, the terrible thirst. But with all of these, with the great weakness and the great mental anguish and sorrow, with all of these, yet he does not excuse himself. He does not see that as a reason to put down the cross. He could have ended his life if he wished, gave up the ghost there and then. He had certainly suffered enough, but he doesn't excuse himself from it. He carries the cross all the way. On that journey, he fell multiple times. Tradition holds it was between three and seven times that he fell. Can we imagine what that suffering must have been like? His body torn by the scourges, the crown of thorns on his head, falling under the weight of his cross, unable to stop or protect himself. Tradition, the common understanding is that our Lord bore the whole weight of the cross. But some, I don't know for sure, but some say that the typical form of execution was for the condemned criminals to carry just the cross piece tied to their shoulders. That the Romans kept up the vertical beam at the place of execution, and the criminals carried the cross beam tied to their shoulders. We don't know if this was the case, but if it was, yes, our Lord would have had less weight to carry, but in his state, that would have been enough. But the falls may have been much worse because with his hands tied to the cross, he would have fell right on his face. No way to stop his fall, slow it down, protect himself. It would have, he would have fell straight on his face, the crown of thorns still on his head. Either way, we can't imagine how painful these were. But with each fall, no matter how excruciating, he rose and carried on. This he did for our encouragement, because there's nothing so disheartening or discouraging on the road to heaven than our repeated falls. We make resolutions, and then shortly afterwards, we fail and want to give up and just stop trying. These falls, these failings of ours, they're not without their advantages because they teach us to know and distrust ourselves. They move us to humility and contrition. So in that sense, even our failings have their advantages. But if we, as the natural inclination is, if we give in to discouragement, that does more harm than the fall itself. Because discouragement springs from pride. You know, if we knew ourselves better, we wouldn't be dis surprised if we fell. When we give into discouragement, though, we foster pride, which is the root of all evil. So if we fail in our resolutions, that's not the greatest evil. The greater evil is that we give up. We give in to discouragement and let pride grow stronger and stronger and paralyze us. We may already know this, but still it's, it's hard not to give in to discouragement. Our Lord knows this, of course, and so he allowed himself to fall repeatedly in spite of the horrible suffering. He could not fall as we fall when we commit sin or fail in our resolutions, because in him there was no sin or imperfection. So he couldn't share in that sense in our failings. But he wished to be like unto us in all things except sin. So in his own way, he imitates us. He falls, crushed under the weight of his cross. But again and again, he rises up and continues on to give us an example of how we are to bear up under the weight of our cross and carry on with our resolutions. He could have ended it. He could have ended it at the scourging or the crowning, 
When he first picked up the cross, it could have been enough. And he could have given up his ghost then and accepted the release of death. But that was not the will of his father. It was the will of his father that he carry the cross to the end, to Calvary. But more than just doing the will of his father, he wished to give us this example, to strengthen us and encourage us on our road to heaven. And how greatly we need that. Because the road to heaven is the road of the cross. There's no other way. We all wish that there was a cross that wasn't heavy, that wasn't a humiliation or a disgrace or a struggle. We don't want the heavy wooden cross. We want a cross of gold or one that is light as a feather. Something that's a decoration rather than a burden. But that is no way to follow after Christ. We can't be a true follower of his unless we follow in his footsteps. As Christ had to suffer these things and so enter into his glory, so also must we. For the servant is not above his master. Let us consider two final lessons. The first, as I just mentioned, is that we must carry our cross. It's not optional for one who says he is a Christian, a follower of Christ. There is no other choice for us. Our cross is the cross of penance, the yoke of God's commandments, overcoming our evil inclinations, bearing the daily crosses of duty, pain, sadness, weakness. As followers of Christ, we must carry the cross if we wish to belong to our Lord, to save our soul, to attain perfection, to gain heaven. And our Lord so instructed us, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. So we must carry the cross or give up our title as Christians. But we must also carry our cross well. We carry it well when we carry it like him. He bore his cross humbly, lovingly, and courageously to the end. As a writer said, the whole life of Christ was a cross and a martyrdom. And dost thou seek for thyself rest and joy? If thou carry the cross willingly, it will carry thee and bring thee to the desired end, to that place where there will be an end of suffering. But if you carry it unwillingly, thou makest it a burden to thee and loadest thyself all the more. And nevertheless, thou must bear it. Set thyself then like a good and faithful servant of Christ to bear manfully the cross of the Lord for the love of him who was crucified for thee. Drink of the chalice of the Lord lovingly if thou desirest to be his friend and to have part with him. And remember, no one is fit to comprehend heavenly things who has not resigned himself to suffer adversities with Christ. May the thought of our dear Savior suffering on his way to Calvary strengthen us to carry our crosses, following in his footsteps. Remember to look beyond the humiliation, the suffering, the annoyance and irritation. Look beyond what you can see and feel, what is temporal, and look for the hand behind the cross, and look at the love of our Lord and our Father, who has prepared this cross for you to follow in the footsteps of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm -hmm.